Alexander of Macedon, chapter 4 of book 1, or part 1, you could say, The Mountains of Memphis. The moment life left Philip's scarred body, Macedon ceased to be. It was not as if a ship had lost its captain, rather as if a ship, half timbered on the shore, had lost its builder. For Philip, son of Amantas, had been the brain, the driving force, the general and the supreme court of the Macedonian clans. No assembly survived him. No experienced ministers existed to carry on the semblance of a government. Nor had Philip named an heir to succeed him. Even his plans for the future remained uncertain because, in his caution, he had at more pains to deceive his enemies than to enlighten his lieutenants. The next day, from Aga and Pella, agents of the Phoenician merchant houses, the Greek city governments, couriers of visiting ambas ambassadors and spies of the Illyrian and Thracian barbarians, slipped away along the roads, or is it Thracian, carrying the news at the end of the Macedonian regime. At Pella, the elder kinsmen and heads of the great clans met with, met with the general officers of the army. For the old tribal custom, for the old tribal custom required that the gathering of the clan heads should decide the question of blood guilt. Over this gathering, Antipater and the one-eyed Antigonus presided. Investigating re Investigation revealed the murderer to be a young Macedonian, Pausanias. He had been killed immediately by the spectators in the courtyard at Aga. Now, well, sometimes you have to be it. Whether it was the right or the wrong thing, you know, you got to be ready to die if one's going to even try to do anything like that. The Pausanias, this Pausanias, it developed, had been injured by followers of Attalus and Cleopatra, who had stripped him and outraged him in public after a drinking bout. So it was the right thing, he it proved that Pausanias had gone from person to person to claim retaliation for the older Atlas. Refused by Philip, he had been seen to visit both Olympias and Alexander. And, yeah, yeah, if, if the king tolerated rape of his own people, that's definitely something that would be a uh, good reason to go kill the king. Um, and Alexander testified that he dismissed Pausanias without discussion. This quarrel had nothing to do with him. He denied giving Pausanias the Celtic knife with which the murderer had, had been committed and that we know, for example, prison rape occurs pretty much entirely with the permission of the state because they could stop virtually all of it, but they don't. They don't go to where there's a lot of safety. Well, corporate prisons, there's, they're about making money. It should be about the safety and the reform, the reform of the prisoners, but it's, it's not. There are monster factories. Um, and... You know, I fear for anybody who leads the country that actually doesn't work to make things better. They're, well, I don't fear for them, but you know what? You know what I mean. Um, one would understand that alone is a reason for maybe um, you know a million Americans to come after any president because um, they figure it was preventable. Yet clearly, someone had instigated the half-crazed youth to attack Philip. Pausanias had belonged to Alexander's circle of companions, some of whom had just been exiled by Philip. Alexander had quarreled 
openly and violently with his father. Well, governors and stuff like that too, as, as I'm saying. It's... Alexander had quarreled openly and violently with his father. He was known to have an ungovernable temper. He had been near the scene of the murder. Moreover, Cleopatra had given birth to a son who might in time have displaced the erratic Alexander, and by bringing back the death penalty and other such things, the general public, too, could be safer. Um, the investigators did not presume to question Olympias, who was both priestess and princess of Epirus, widow of Philip, and mother of the man under suspicion, Alexander. Servants testified that Olympias, on being told of the murder, had murmured something like, Upon husband, upon father, and upon bride, which proved to be a line written by Euripedus, but was hardly understandable, or in any respect, evidence. At that point, the investigation ended. By clan law, the killing of a member of the royal family by another of the same blood was an act that could not be judged or atoned by kinsmen or generals. Those same kinsmen and generals remembered only too well how blood guilt had lain upon Philip's family before now. Philip's mother, Eurydice, an adulteress, had arranged the death of his elder brother, Perdicas. Now, totally understand, I don't, you know, saying, hey, you know, it's it, it has nothing to do with me. It doesn't say, well, he could have said it, it's nothing to do with my father, but that's not quite the same thing. It was a public thing. But Alexander wasn't in, wasn't the head of the state, as you could say. So, there's a... Um, but yeah, it could have been entirely... We don't need further explanation that someone else must have put him up to it when it comes to stuff like that. Those same kinsmen and generals remembered only too well how blood guilt had lain upon Philip's family before now. Philip's mother, mother Eurydice, an adulterer, arranged the death of his elder brother, Perdicus. Okay. Uh, while a group of Macedonians, headed by Attalus, believed Alexander guilty, the majority fell then, and believed therefore, uh, thereafter that Olympias had edged Pausanias on to attack Philip. The knife of Pausanias had been diverted in some way from Attalus against Philip. Of the assassination itself, Alexander would say nothing. Yeah, if he if he went if he if he went to the head and say, This needs to be dealt with, and they didn't deal with it, he could have came back and definitely uh and, and the mother, yeah, it, it kind of sounds like the mother was like, um, yeah, Philip has responsibility. You know, he did, but, um, passing over in this way the question of the blood guilt, the council of the clans had to name a new ruler of the Macedonians. From the moment of Philip's death, someone must reign in his place if the great clans were not to revert to their isolation in the highlands the army officers would take over philip's task of organization but the army especially the men in the ranks had to have their titular head of the blood of philip most conveniently the idiotic Ardas would serve as a figurehead the older amantas would carry on the royal name, or Antipater and Antigonus would serve as regents for Cleopatra's newborn son. Against choice of Alexander, there were several counts. The rumor that Philip had not fathered him, his antisocial absorption in study and inexperience in command, the open blood feud that had started with Philip's murder, for such a death among the clans would lead to others. The veteran generals insisted that a decision had to be made instantly and held to, and they made the decision, in spite of all argument, afterward. Antipater and Antagonus 
went to Alexander's study. When he looked up from his books and offered them benches, they remained standing. They explained to him the verdict of the army. Philip had named no successor, but Philip had assigned his 20-year-old son, Alexander, to duty with the army. And after Karana'a Alexander had performed such duty, now he was king of the Macedonians. When the versatile and all-confident chief, well, not all-confident, but uh, certainly thought himself that way, right, of, Ch of staff, Parmenio, hurried back from the eastern frontier, he approved the choice of the others at Pella. Probably the three great commanders felt that the Macedonian army believed the youthful Alexander to be favored of the gods, if not born of a god. I don't believe in any god that's going to have a child or be a child of anything. And this army of farmers and mountaineers would follow no leader of whom it did not approve. The three generals thought that the daydreaming student would hardly interfere with their plans. Of this triumvirate, the diplomatic Parmenio made an indispensable link between the arrogant and ambitious Antigonus and the loyal Antipater, whose thoughts did not rise above carrying out orders. The three commanders knew, but Alexander soon discovered that after Philip's death, Macedonian power had shrunk from an expanding Hellenic federation to a small kingdom. On three sides of this kingdom, the highland tribes reverted promptly to their natural independence. Beyond lay the threat of the barbarian Celts along the Danube. Keltoi, as the Greeks called them, so that's where we get the word Celt from. Pressing towards the sea, the roving Scuthian Stepa clans, the Greek cities, deserted the Hellenic League promptly. Athens held public celebration of the death of the man she had made a citizen only a year before. Cosine deleting Athenians, a weighty shipment of gold coin arrived mysteriously from Asia. Demosthenes was again acclaimed as leader of Greek democracy. On the other hand, the staff knew only too well what the resources were. Philip had piled risk upon risk, his tour de force and wrestling leadership from Greek cities under the guise of Captain General now yielding nothing tangible. There was no longer a Captain General and no longer a Hellas. True, the Greeks did not know the weakness of the Macedonian army. By his rapid maneuvering, the astute Philip had allowed foreign spies no opportunity observing, of observing its numbers. Yet the staff realized that the Macedonian corps of the army, the Peza Teri, Balancemen, the companions of the Hapaspists, numbered no more than 17 to 18,000. Other detachments, such as the Thessalian Caval Cavalry and Agrianians, with lighter allied contingents, have been linked to the army by Philip's leadership alone. The conditions of the treasury were more alarming than that of the armed forces. It had some 70 talents, weights of bullions and coins, while it owed 1,300 talents. Philip had gambled on getting new revenues from the rich Asiatic coast. Pella did not have the money enough to meet expenses for more than two months. Philip had gambled on creating a greater state and had left the original Macedon in danger. In this crisis, Aristotle agreed with the generals on the first thing to do, reassert mastery. You know, the white flag means maintained. Well, it, that's that's what it means. Kalafa, uh, you know, um, doesn't mean surrender, but it does in a way. One's surrendered to one's mastery. Um,
In this crisis, Aristotle agreed with the generals on the first thing to do, research mastery over the restless tribes. So Alexander left Pella almost at once on this mission, with the field army leaving Antipater to hold Pella. He rode off with the generals resolute, eh, irresolute, uncertain how to meet the responsibilities Philip had borne so carelessly. His family, his familiar world of study, had been lost, not to be found again. Demosthenes said at this time that the student had come to his graduation. Shy, introspective, the Macedonian had been accustomed to trust people at sight, to take the advice of friends. His world had been one of imagination, with cities that lay beyond the horizon and mountain ranges that were parapanisades, peopled by kindly, well, entities. Um, in questioning towards this dream region, he had followed Aristotle upon the still untrodden track of study of the evolution of human beings. As with Demosthenes, his knowledge smelled of the study lamp, yet of no ordinary lamp. In other respects, he was normal as Hephaestion, or Ptolemy, both of the blood royal, being, between, uh, being, however, more stubborn, feeling responsibly, more deeply, and having greater physical beauty. So, at twenty years of age, he started on his journey. In little more than a year, he had changed into a man of decision, trustful of advice, going headlong at danger, and determined to lead his army into Asia, away from his homeland, and, in the following years, he developed a capacity for inspired leadership, an ability to shape events on strange lands and seas, and the determination to achieve what had been attempted hitherto. What influenced him and what forced his thoughts into new channels during this brief year is little known. Certainly he received very quickly the news of the deaths in Pella. His cousin among us had been poisoned, and Cleopatra's infant son had been found strangled. With these two out of the way, he had no male blood kin except half-witted Arhedaas. Olympias alone would have wished for the deaths of those two. He remembered the words she had spoken of retribution upon father and husband and bride, and, after, he never went back willingly to Pella. The palace and the new city must have been, in his imagination, antagonistic and terrible. <laughs>